Welcome to this session of Meeting C++. We have with us Patricia Ars, and she will talk to us about uh, memory exploitation. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Uh, Patricia, take it away. Thank you so much, Fabian. Uh, so, I'm going to read to you as uh, a bit from a blog post uh, that came out uh, many years ago now. Um, basically, an attacker can grab 64K of memory from a server. The attack leaves no trace and can be done multiple times to grab different uh, a different random 64K of memory. This means that anything in memory, SSL, private keys, user keys, anything is vulnerable. And you have to assume that all of it is compromised, all of it. Catastrophic is the right word. On a scale from 1 to 10, this is an 11. So this was uh, from uh, Bruce Schneier's blog post uh, about Heartbleed in, in uh, 2014. Now Heartbleed is now quite old, but it is very interesting and we're going to talk about it for a couple of reasons. Uh, so the bug itself, it was a buffer overread uh, and also uh, an attacker controlled size. And these two things uh, made it uh, very easy to exploit. Also, it was a remote attack. Um, it was remote, it was high value. And this is probably the most important part of Heartbleed, uh, that it was targeting the, uh, the process that had loaded OpenSSL library into uh, its process. And so this process, whatever it was, uh, was, was expecting to be contacted uh, over the internet, uh, but it also had high value memory. Uh, so you would have all sorts of things uh, in this memory that would be interesting. Uh, in addition, you could basically dump the entire uh, virtual address space of the process uh, using Heartbleed. The other problem uh, with it was that it was widely deployed. Like OpenSSL was used everywhere. It was used on everything from, from uh, smart light bulbs uh, to, to servers, right? Uh, a lot of these things weren't designed to be updated at all, uh, but they were now vulnerable for, the, uh, for this attack. So we're going to talk about uh, memory exploitation uh, in this uh, talk. I've done some talks before where I talked about stack-based attacks, uh, but the, here we're going to be talking about the heap. Uh, so let's look at the description for the CVE for, for Heartbleed. Uh, so it says that the uh, TLS and the DTLS implementation in OpenSSL 1 of 1 before 101G, do not properly ha handle the heartbeat extension packets. Now, the heartbeat extension packets was a very simple protocol uh, where, where a client would send uh, some, some sort of, of, of packet and, and the, the server would then uh, reply with the same packet. That was the idea. Um, unfortunately, you could lie about how much data you sent. Uh, so, uh, so the, the second part here says, which allows remote, uh, remote attackers to obtain sensitive information from process memory via crafted packets that trigger a buffer overread. Now, Heartbleed is a prime example of what is in security circles called an information leak. Um, an information leak can mean most many things, but it means in itself that what you are leaking is information. It doesn't give you any kind of execution, uh, any, uh, any other type. You don't crash the application necessarily. Uh, and the goal of, a, of an information leak is usually intelligence gathering of some sort. Now, in this case, you, were, you could dump the entire memory of the process, maybe get some keys. Then you could use those keys to log into the server, perhaps, or, things, uh, or, or use them against whatever, right? Um, but oftentimes when you have information leaks, you're often leaking addresses, uh, and that's because to, to uh, defeat address-based layout randomization, you often want to know where things are in memory. So if you can get the process to leak addresses in memory to known objects, then you could try to map out the address space. But in this case, you can use Heartbleed to dump the entire contents of the virtual address space. Uh, which was demonstrated multiple times by, by security researchers. So Heartbleed was famous 
for how devastating it was to the entire industry. Like this changed how we approached computer security, how we approached device upgrades. It changed a lot of things about how we work. Uh, but it also became the poster child for fuzzing. And that's because Heartlink was found by fuzzing, by two independent teams, and uh, more or less playing around, testing their fuzzers at the same time. More or less the same time, two different teams found uh, Heartbleed. And, and the reason for that is that it, it's, uh, and I, I do this in my training, actually, <laughs> uh, we find Heartbleed. It's super easy to find. Um, once you fuzz the right interface, it is ridiculously easy to find. Uh, and it became a, sort of a very easy example to show how fuzzing can find uh, bugs. So my name is Patricia Alls. I'm a trainer and consultant. I'm doing a training on Monday and Tuesday <laughs> uh, for meeting C++. Um, I'm a C++ programmer. I've been focusing a lot on application security for the past uh, few years. Uh, but I've been working sort of in that in, in the nearby area for most of my career. I work for my uh, company that I co-founded called TurtleSack, uh, but I've previously worked uh, a bunch of different places. My first job was at Opera Software, working on the original Opera browser. Then I worked uh, as a Java consultant for a couple of years. And then I went back to C++ as uh, Cisco, making embedded telepresence systems. And uh, then I went back to doing uh, browser again at Vivaldi. Uh, I have a master's degree in computer science, and my pronouns are she, they. So, but let's get back to fuzzing. So what is fuzzing, really? So let's, I'll give you an example of a type of fuzzing, uh, which, which is the common type of fuzzing that is done today. So this is, is what is often referred to as coverage-guided fuzzing. So in coverage-guided fuzzing, we're going to start with a bunch of inputs. Now, these are usually represented as files in the file system. So we have a bunch of files that, we, that have the data that we're going to feed the function that we are fuzzing. Um, these are often called the corpus. So when we start our fuzzer, uh, the, it, it will take a look in the corpus. Then it will pick one, uh, one of these. And these are, these are valid inputs. So these are like non-crashing inputs. Uh, so if I was trying to fuzz, let's say, an op open source application, I might go and look at files used in unit tests and things like that in, in, inside of the, the source code uh, to try to find like different sorts of files that would exercise the application in different ways. So, so these are good inputs, uh, hopefully exercising the application in many different ways. Uh, so the fuzzer will pick one of these inputs then make some change to it. And this change has uh, some randomness to it, but also some strategy. So there are some like heuristics here, uh, but a change will be made. And it will also record both what change it made and also which input it used. Um, then it will feed this, this, uh, this input, this modified input to the, the, uh, the application that you're fuzzing. So if this is a library, then you would have to build an application that loads this library and then fuzz it uh, in that manner. But this target application is instrumented and it's instrumented, it can be instrumented in a variety of ways, but one of the things that we want is that it has to, uh, to report back coverage. And this is, this is the model for coverage guided uh, fuzzing. Now this coverage is very similar to probably what you've seen uh, when it comes to, to um, tests to see test coverage. Uh, so the idea here is that the fuzzer wants to see, uh, given this input, can I reach code paths that I haven't reached before? Uh, so even if this input that it, it, and, and this input that it created might, might not cause the application to crash, but it actually entered an if that the fuzzer has never been inside before or it ended up calling a function that had never been called by any previous input. So, so if, if the, the coverage uh, by this input, it, it increases to what the fuzzer had previously, the fuzzer will record this input as interesting and will keep it for later and think, okay, if I do more modifications on this input, then maybe I can reach more code, right? And the reason why this is, 
is uh, extremely important as an optimization <laughs> is because you need optimizations for fuzzing because the, the fact is we're doing basically mutations on often binary data uh, and and the, the 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 amount of mutations that you can do is exponential in all sorts of directions uh, so this becomes extremely slow so you want to make sure that whatever you uh, whatever input you're looking at and you're continuing to mutate, it should be something that is leading you in a sensible direction. So in coverage guided fuzzing, it is mostly about trying to reach all parts of the, uh, of the code uh, with, with the inputs that you have. So this is a learning process, right, for the fuzzer. Uh, there also might be a crash. So, so perhaps this input caused the target to crash. Uh, then you want to, to record the crash uh, and the input that caused it to crash. Now, this could be extremely useful, like for attaching to maybe a bug report or something, that this, this input here caused the application to crash. You can maybe load it up in your debugger. You can, you can try to see if you can reproduce the crash. So that's really nice. Okay, so now we have an idea on how we might be able to find a bug in an application. So we might be able to, to use fuzzing to find, find a bug. Um, but the thing is, OK, I, I can find things that crash. But very often, and we know that, especially memory bugs in C++, they don't crash, right? Mostly, they just kind of linger, <laughs> corrupting memory for a while, and might crash in the future sometime. So we want, actually, to get the application to crash. Uh, to be able to record the crashing input. Now you can, th and this makes it interesting because now we can actually use the causing the application to crash as a way to, to, uh, to signal input that is interesting. So you can use this in a variety of ways for crashing it on purpose uh, by adding asserts or things like that. Uh, but we're going to do a different tack for, for especially for finding memory errors. Now the combination I'm going to talk about here is the most popular uh, combination out there among security researchers. Uh, so when you are seeing memory vulnerabilities in, uh, in like all of the big memory vulnerabilities, almost all of them are found this way. So we want the application to crash when there is a memory error. And a lot of you know how to do that. We use sanitizers, or more specifically, we use address sanitizer. Uh, and that is, that is the case. Most security researchers will use address sanitizer together with fuzzing. Uh, often, uh, libfuzzer uh, will be used because it's quite fast. So you can com combine libfuzzer and, and, and uh, Clang uh, with sanitizers like, like Ubisan or address sanitizer. Uh, and it's quite easy to fuzz an application that you can compile. Now, if you cannot compile the application, there are ways of doing this, harnessing a, a binary application. But you will generally then use uh, maybe some sort of emulation layer uh, to give you some of the feedback and crashiness that we're looking for. But this is, this is the, the simple way. So if you can do it this way, then this works. Uh, so what is address sanitizer? Address sanitizer itself will, will be compiler instrumentation of the binary. So it will insert instructions, generally before loads and stores and things like that. Um, in addition, there is a runtime component that will be recording all sorts of, of debug information that will be used if an error occurs, like stacks from when memory was allocated, when it was deallocated, when it was used after free, things like that. It will also, uh, it's also instrumenting memory, with what is often called uh, shadow memory. So the runtime library is, is basically a malloc replacement. And so how do we use it? Uh, so you can pass uh, f sanitize equals address uh, to client. But it, and it will, if you run the application and it has some sort of uh, overflow, perhaps, then address sanitizer will error out the moment the overflow is triggered. So this is dynamic analysis, right? Uh, now, this was introduced in Clang like over 10 years ago. Uh, but it was adopted uh, very quickly in GCC, and much more recently in Visual Studio. 
But in addition, versions of address sanitizer has been adapted to almost every kernel out there. So there is, a, is an address sanitizer for, for the Linux kernel, for the BSD kernels, for, you know, whatever, whatever kernel you're using, they've made uh, address sanitizer uh, replacements for those kernels to be able to find memory errors. Yeah, so it, it started in Clang, uh, got into GCC, and is now on Visual Studio. And for about a year, it's been available for 64-bit. For Before then, it was only available for 32-bit. So this is something that you will find on every platform. It's available on Mac, uh, Linux, and Windows, on various compilers. So, so this, of all the sanitizers, this is is the, the one that has the widest adoption in compilers. Now, what the address sanitizer gives us is crash-like behavior at the moment of, of a, a memory error. So if we, can, if we can combine this with fuzzing, we get a supercharged fuzzer. Uh, so if we can trigger any type of memory error, then the fuzzer will, will record it as a crash, and we can look at the input and see if we can exploit it in somehow, some, some way. Uh, and so that will make it easier for us to find bugs that might be harder to find otherwise. So the combination of coverage guided fuzzing uh, with address sanitizer makes it really easy to find memory errors in C++ and C applications. And that, in my opinion, is the reason for the massive surge in memory-related bugs uh, that we've seen in the past few years, because they are super easy to find. Uh, and they're even easier to find if it's your application. So you should definitely be doing this yourself. So the basic uh, technique is we want to make the application crashy by using sanitizers. We want to provoke weird behavior, and I'm going to get back into what weird behavior is, but, but we're going to use these sanitizers to make the application crash here. We're going to use the fuzzer to feed lots of weird input to our application, and then we want to analyze uh, the crashes that we get out to see um, what was it that caused the crash? Is this something that we can control? Another thing that is really important about fuzzing is that we are pushing this input from the boundary of the application. So if, you, if we're fuzzing a specific interface to the application, we know that from that interface, we can reach this crashy code with this input. So you could have some kind of part of your application that is vulnerable to something, but it's totally unreachable from the outside. But with fuzzing, we know that we can reach it from the outside because we did. So we found a bug, right? Now we, now what? Um, so then we get to exploitation. Uh, and very often you will see with people who are professional uh, uh, security researchers that they will often specialize. Uh, so you might have teams where some people are, are specialized in finding bugs and, and some people are specialized in exploiting bugs. So here I want to talk about uh, the, a model for thinking about exploitation, which I do talk about a lot in my training, um, uh, which, is a, which is a model called the weird machine. But first I have to kind of present to you uh, the underlying uh, idea here. And the idea here is that you as a programmer has, have a mental model for how your program is supposed to work. So imagine that we have some sort of program that prints you know, secret, colon, and then the user is supposed to type something. So then if a user types Joshua, we'll say access granted. If the user types David, we'll say access denied. Um, so this is how we imagine that our application works. Uh, so if access was granted, then uh, we will be launching missiles. And it, either way, we'll say operation complete. So this is how we intended our application to work. Either it, you know, either it was, it was the right password, or if it, or it wasn't the right password. But either way, the program will exit in the end. But what if someone types something really long, right? If we have a stack allocated fixed size array, then here we might have a stack buffer overflow, right? And it might cause the application to crash or a corrupt memory or something. 
Now this state is an unintended state for the program. It's not a, in, not a state of the program that the, the programmer ever intended the program to be in. And so in this, in, in the, weird, uh, the weird machine model, these states are called weird states. Uh, oftentimes weird states are very unstable and will usually cause the application to crash. Uh, but the goal of exploitation in, of native applications is to try to control weird states so the application doesn't crash and we can do something else. So if we imagine here on the, uh, on the left that we're seeing, uh, this is the programmer's like mental model for how this program is supposed to work. Uh, and we have some sort of vulnerability. So in this case, we had a stack buffer overflow, right? Uh, when, when it overflows, it will bring us to a weird state. And our goal is then to use that weird state and some sort of functionality in the program to bring us to another weird state. And from maybe from there to multiple other ones. But in the end, what we want to do is run our shell code. So this is the, this is the basic idea of exploitation. Uh, some of the stuff that I go through in my training is different ways that these things can happen, but the basic model is the same. Now, this model uh, of a, a weird machine was introduced uh, by Sergei Bratos, who's a professor, uh, and Halva Flake, which is, whose name is actually Thomas Dolan. Um, he, he refined it, wrote a paper. It's very interesting uh, for, for grasping this, especially if you're coming from computer science or, or math. Both of these were our, our, our mathematicians by, by, uh, by education. Uh, but let's get back to what is shellcode, right? Uh, so so this, is, this is a word that a lot of people are not familiar with. So let's, let's see. So it's a piece of code. Uh, in our case, it's, it's basically a compiled assembly. So it's typically a machine code. And it's so often uh, it's then delivered and executed as a part of the exploit. Uh, basically, often as a, as a character array of, of with the bytes um, delivered somewhere and, and maybe copied around the memory. Um, it's called shellcode because the, the compiled program, which is the, the shellcode, uh, was often, uh, at least in the 80s and 90s, uh, used to start a shell, like bash or sh or whatever. Uh, and that's basically to prove that you have code execution on this machine. So if you could start uh, a shell, and uh, then that means you could basically do anything. Um, today, there are modern versions of this. So you would often hear Windows uh, exploiters call, say things like pop calc, uh, which means they started the, the calculator uh, on Windows. In real exploits, you generally don't do this. Uh, you often uh, deliver some other type of mechanism that makes it easier to do uh, some kind of secondary stage. Um, uh, exploitation. Sometimes you can have multiple stages of shellcode leading to the installation of some kind of rootkit or something. So, so this, this can be quite complicated in real life uh, exploitation today. But usually what you're looking for is to install something on the machine that makes it possible for you to later control this machine remotely. So if you're looking at an uh, exploit in itself, it usually has multiple components. And today, most have uh, all three of these components that I'll show you, and usually multiples of each one. Uh, so it needs some kind of way to read the memory, the, addre the, like, the address space of the, uh, of the target process. It needs some way to write to that memory, and it needs a way to execute code inside of that memory. Um, so the reading of memory is often called information leaks. So writing of memory was what you would want to do for planting your shellcode, and then you need some way to run your shellcode. So how? So let's see about code execution. So a lot of people have, uh, have probably heard about remote code execution and all sorts of things like that. Uh, so the idea here is basically code execution. We want our shellcode to run. And to do that, we need uh, to control the instruction pointer so that it jumps to our shellcode. 
So wherever we have managed to write our shell code in the memory of the process, we want the instruction pointer to jump there and start executing that code. Now we have many different mechanisms in, in native applications for the instruction pointer to move. Um, and here we are looking for a way to control those jumps. So for example, in uh, returning from a function, we have a return address on the stack, for example, maybe in an x86 scenario, uh, you could have a virtual function call uh, or a function pointer. With a virtual function call, you are using uh, pointers in the virtual function table. Uh, in a function pointer, you could have just a function pointer. You could have a whole table of function pointers. Now, these kinds of, of, of things, of capabilities that, that an attacker uh, manages to accumulate in your application are often called primitives. So within each category of read, write, uh, and execute, uh, you will have different types of capabilities, and they usually call by different names. So, so this is as a vulnerability or a capability. And why I'm saying vulnerability or a capability is because it could be a feature. It might not be a bug. Uh, but it can be used as a, as a part of a wider exploit. They are often, often have like very uh, explanatory names once you know what they are. Uh, so you can have something like arbitrary read primitive. This means that I can read memory at an arbitrary location in the address space. On the other hand, you know, you might not be able to read arbitrarily uh, any address. You might only be like, I could have a read of, you know, um, three bytes uh, within, uh, let's say, a thousand bytes of the beginning of some buffer. So you might have like, this, these can be modulated in many different ways. Uh, you have something called the write what where primitive. That means I have a way to write what I want at, at whatever address of my choosing. Um, a read where is I have a way to read whatever I want at whatever address I want in the memory. And so you have many different versions of these with, you know, and they might be, um, have um, modif like modifiers to them. Like I have a, a an arbitrary read primitive of five bytes, right? Um, I have a write what where primitive uh, within two pages of the beginning of something. Um, but they're often referred to as primitives. So let's look at what kind of mitigations exist, right? So uh, to try to, 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 uh, to mitigate some of these some of these capabilities, things have been introduced in in compilers or in the platforms to try to to avoid these things happening. Uh, so, for example, some of the some of the ways that uh, that platforms uh, and compilers have have worked to try to make it diff more difficult to execute code uh, in memory is by, for example, introducing non-executable memory or non-executable stacks. This is basically a, is a feature where you uh, which you, you mark the page as it's loaded into memory whether or not it should it, it should be executable. Uh, you also have stack canaries uh, which uh, try to detect uh, stack buffer overflows, uh, and there are many other features trying to to avoid this. Uh, some of them quite advanced. Uh, for writing memory, uh, you have uh, you have address based layout randomization. And, and that is mostly about trying to make sure that uh, addresses are not predictable. So it does affect multiple parts of this, both reading and memory and writing and uh, execution. If you don't necessarily know the layout of the uh, virtual address space, it makes things quite difficult. And so actually to, to target that, we will today see almost always uh, some kind of, of, uh, of information leak. Um, so, so we have uh, we have ways of trying to to avoid people reading uh, things that are interesting, and that's address-based layer randomization. But you might also want to limit uh, the the access to interesting information. Like if you have uh, have a part of your application that has a lot of high-value memory, you might want to 
maybe separate it out into a separate process, maybe, maybe sandbox it more carefully. Be, so there are many different ways you can do this. But what about just cleaning memory? Like, let's say that you have, like, one thing that we remember from, from the whole heart bleed thing was that there were, like, stuff just lying around in memory. Some of it was in, in parts of memory that was, was deallocated. Some of it was just randomly, like, memory, right? That wasn't even valid. So how about we just kind of try to clean any kind of sensitive information that we have so we only have it in memory for a very short time. Actually, this idea was widely used for a long time and also caused a different, uh, a different vulnerability. And this was caused by a change in compilers. Uh, it was an optimization technique called dead store elimination. Here, compilers are allowed to optimize away stores that cannot be detected. So a lot of places, uh, applications were mem setting memory to zero. Uh, and that had worked for many years. And then they upgraded their compiler and the optimizer optimized the way the mem set. So, so when you read the code, you would say, oh, here, okay, this buffer, we're mem setting it to zero, but the mem setting actually was optimized away and never occurred. I, I jokingly refer to this as the case of the disappearing mem set. But let's go back to the heap. Uh, so, to understand how heap exploitation works, we have to have like a, a very short introduction to, to allocators. Um, so let's look at, uh, at a very simple pool allocator and how it could look. And we'll, we'll use that as, as sort of a model. So imagine that this is our memory and we have to, 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 um, to provide chunks of memory to our application. So when let's say that we're here, we're, we're implementing malloc, right? Or something similar. So, so if the application asks for some memory, then we will allocate that memory, right? So, so, okay, so the application got these three and then maybe these five and then two and then three, right? So we're just kind of filling up memory with these objects uh, that are varying sizes. But then we have suddenly the application deallocated something. So now we have a hole. Now, if we were in a garbage collected uh, language, then this could be like compacted and things like that. But in, in C and C++, that is not the case. These addresses need to be stable. We can't move these objects around. So now we have a little hole and we don't want to fragment our heap because that might be problematic later. So, okay, so let's save this, right? We'll just save a pointer to this. Like I have a little thing here, which, which if somebody asks for a two, then they can, might get this, this slot right here. Uh, then somebody, uh, so the application deallocated the first allocation. So now we have another hole. Okay, so maybe if we just like, okay, we're gonna make a list of these, of these little chunks that are free. So that the next time somebody tries to allocate something, we might give them something, uh, one of these holes instead. Then you have suddenly this, this adjacent chunk was deallocated. So what are we gonna do now? Like, are we going to, to put them together to make a larger chunk? Or maybe we just want to link it in like we did with the other ones? All of these are questions that are, are, are things that an allocator will have to work out how to deal with these things. The thing is, the, 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 the basic approach has been very similar across many allocators over time. So how can we exploit this behavior? These are, this is, your allocator will work in some way like this. So how can we exploit this? Well, one thing we can do, like as an attacker, we can try to allocate objects on the heap. Now this could be legitimate objects, like we could send a buffer to some kind of server uh, application and then the server will copy maybe that into some kind of buffer on the heap. So that's a way that we can allocate memory on the heap by sending messages maybe to the server application. But the first uh, example we're gonna be looking at is something called heap spring. Now heap spring was very popular, uh, uh, especially amongst people who were uh, doing a browser exploitation, you know, uh, let's say 10 years ago, uh, it was very popular. 
And, and, and the reason for that is it was very easy to allocate on the heap uh, in the browser because they were doing this from JavaScript. They just would create like JavaScript strings uh, to do it. But let's have a look at how it works. So the basic idea is we want to fill the memory with, with a certain byte sequence, as many as possible. Uh, and then in that, we probably have our shell code. Um, the idea is that if we then later can hijack the instruction pointer to just jump into the heap anywhere, uh, we hope to get to a point where we can run our shell code. Now, this technique uh, used a specific uh, format of, of, uh, of the exploitation string um, to make this more uh, probable. So if you imagine that this is our shellcode string, uh, then you would add lots of no-ops here in the beginning. So these are no-ops instructions uh, in bytes. And then at the end, we have our actual payload. This is the code that we want to run. Uh, this, this chunk of no-ops is often called a no-ops sled or a nop sled. The idea was that if you filled the entire heap with strings that look like this, or most of the shellcode string might be no ops, then a random jump will probably hit inside of the no ops uh, chunk of this. And then it will, the instruction pointer will just no op, no op, no op all the way through until it hits the payload and execute it. So it was a very probabilistic uh, type of attack. So it would look something like this. So you would have all of your normal allocations on the heap, and then you would just fill memory with this thing. And then at a certain point later, you might manage to get to, to get the instruction pointer to jump into a random place in the heap, and then you would execute your shellcode. Now this, of course, required uh, that the heap was executable, but at the time, that was very common. This is a very scattershot kind of thing. We're just kind of blasting all this copy of our, our exploit string all over the heap, right? So maybe we can do this with a little bit more fine-grained control. So that brings us to heap grooming, also, also called heap feng shui. Um, now, the idea here is to try to create uh, predictable patterns on the heap uh, and then trick the allocator to, to allocate a specific chunk to us as an attacker. Uh, this should be a chunk that we can control, maybe adjacent to another chunk that we can control so that we could have some kind of predictable uh, behavior in heap. This is often used for a heap buffer overflows. So let's see what that could look like in reality. So, so first I have to introduce this a little bit. So we have something called the shadow brokers. Um, this is a hacking group that was behind the leak that uh, leaked in uh, 2016, 2017. They had multiple leaks. Uh, we're going to be looking specifically at uh, the last leak that they did. Um, the, the, uh, they leaked exploits and tooling that is, uh, is assumed to be NSA uh, tooling. Um, and a lot of people today uh, suspect that the shadow brokers uh, are in fact Russian and Russian intelligence. The leak was done in several batches, but we're going to be looking at the last one, which, in, which was basically Windows tooling. And inside of that, we're going to be looking at the, in, the eternal blue exploit. So, I'm not going to go very into the, uh, the application that it uh, attacked, but this was basically all of these, uh, all of the exploits that are, are in this eternal uh, grouping are going for attacking Windows SMB v1, which, uh, which, was, um, which was an IPC type of mechanism on Windows. Uh, so, <laughs> so basically we have a client it sends some kind of request to some kind of server, and then it gets some kind of response. Now, since the, the request can go over several uh, messages, then, then the state for, for the request is stored on the server. And so these objects, while uh, the request is opened, uh, are stored on the heap in the server. Uh, and this makes it possible to control both 
the length of allocation, like when it gets allocated and when it gets deallocated, might get deallocated when you close the connection, maybe. Uh, so you can control that, and you can also control the content uh, and and things like that. So so these these vulnerabilities were based on 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 vulnerabilities in this mechanism, specifically around the server handling messages. So there are a bunch of, of exploits in this uh, eternal exploits uh, family. Um, the basic idea for all of them was to install this double pulsar backdoor uh, on Windows. And this was the, the mechanism that they would have then for being able to control this machine post, post exploitation. So the, the whole idea was to install this double pulsar backdoor and then it was over. So Eternal Blue became the most famous, but there are variations on it called Eternal Champion, Eternal Romance, and Eternal Synergy. Most of these were basically trying to address different types of, of uh, security mitigations in Windows uh, to try to make it work again. Uh, but we're just going to look at Eternal Blue to show you how this might look in, in practice. So the the foundation of eternal blue is a write what where primitive and remote code execution it's based on a buffer overflow on the heap uh, together with a heap spray and a heap grooming now there was basically one main bug that was behind this and and i want to show that to you to show you how small of a vulnerability can be and how devastating it was um, so, so this this bug was the main bug and the reason why uh, re you could remotely install uh, the double pulsar backdoor. When updating the length of the list, the size is written to as if it were a 16-bit U short when it's actually a 32-bit U long. This means that the upper 16 bits are not updated when the list gets truncated. So this is from uh, the Microsoft uh, analysis. Now, one of the things that, that is probably true, I'll show you the code, but this is probably a part of a refactoring that happened. This code is very old. It, it predates Windows itself. This is, goes back to the 80s. So the code is very old, and it went through several refactorings. And one of those refactorings was going from 16-bit to 32-bit. To, to and, and what uh, I think or I suspect is that this bug was a result of that refactoring. So let's look at uh, the, the code before. Uh, so here we have this, this, and of course I've done some copy and pasting to try to fit it on the slide, but, but here we have this, this CB list, which is uh, a length, uh, and it's uh, U long. And at a certain point, uh, there is an attempt to, to reset this value to a sensible value. Um, and it calls this SMB put you short. Uh, and, and here we are basically setting bytes uh, and we are only setting two of them. So when this is called, uh, we are only resetting uh, the, the, the lower D word here, not the high D word. So if you had a significantly hot, a, like a large value in this, this resetting did not work. It would only reset the, uh, the, the low, low D word. Uh, the fix for it was very simple. It just used a different function. So it called SMB put U long, which actually uh, did uh, reset the entire uh, U long. So this is, this is the bug and this was the fix. Uh, it's very, very small, very easy to miss. Um, and I just wanted to show you what it would look like. So, so uh, the, the, the exploitation itself is a heap grooming and spray, which I mentioned before. So we need some way to prime the heap, and then we want to, to uh, fill it with blocks that are ready for self shell code. Now, the reason for this is that we are, in, because of the S, how SMB works, there is a lot of control of the heap by these requests and these connections. Uh, so, so you could um, fill buffers in pending requests and things like that. Uh, then we will make some room in the heap 
uh, for for another type of, of, of request and then we will in there we will do a buffer overrun. Uh, the overrun will overrun into an adjacent uh, an adjacent block and and there we will overrun amongst other things a, a, a function pointer. Yeah. So let's look at what that would look like. So this is just just to 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 give you a mental visualization. So we have some sort of initial state. This is the heap. It has you know some initial allocations. In the heap grooming, then you will fill, uh, you will do a bunch of allocations generally into your size to be able to try to fill in all of the holes uh, between the regular allocations. And this gives you, gives us kind of a clean slate afterwards uh, for, for trying to create our predictable patterns. So these uh, could be called grooming packets. So for our heap grooming. Then we fill the rest of it with, you know, our pattern objects. So this is basically just so now we have full control of this entire uh, contiguous section of memory. Um, these are also grooming packets and some, sometimes referred to as second stage grooming packets. And so what we want to do is we want to free up some holes here and that are predictable size. So these are uh, the same size as our second stage grooming packets here. So we know how big these holes are. So then we, in, in this case, there, uh, there are SMB packages that are being sent that fit into this hole, right? So now we have, we made holes for them specifically, and we are hoping now that they are adjacent to this, this other type of grooming packet. When we then do uh, a buffer overflow, we're overflowing into adjacent objects. And one of the things that we can do then is overflow, for example, um, uh, uh, function pointers uh, inside of these objects and later on uh, when these objects are deallocated or some kind of function is called on them uh, then they might execute or jump through those uh, pointers uh, and in this case they are pointing back into the the overflow buffer uh, and in this case, the, the, the pointer that is being overflowed is some kind of cleanup function that happens when you close the connection. So we send uh, the shell code to everything because we don't necessarily know where everything is. And when the connection is closed, the shell code is executed because we overflow the function pointer uh, in, in the, the ones that were overrun. Uh, and this will then install the double pulsar backdoor. Um, so this was a tool used by the NSA for, for many, many different years. And you can see that through how it was maintained. It was probably uh, one of the, the most powerful tools that they had. Uh, one of the things that was, was clear the moment this was leaked, it became very stressful for a lot of people because they saw that it worked against basically every version of Windows. Uh, one thing they realized, though, after a little bit, was that only a few months earlier, Windows had ins had, had um, given out uh, an, an out-of-band uh, patch uh, for Windows to pa that patch specifically the vulnerabilities here. It is widely thought that NSA, when they realized that this leak was forthcoming, uh, actually uh, uh, did notify Microsoft so that Microsoft could fix it. And, and, and Microsoft has released patches uh, going way back to try to fix this. Uh, but, but it was uh, quite devastating at the time. Uh, the problem is also that a lot of people who have Windows machines are, are, don't upgrade or are not able to upgrade. Uh, so Eternal Blue was later used uh, in multiple ransomware attacks. Uh, for example, uh, WannaCry and NotPetya. Uh, that that cost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worldwide and also disrupted multiple industries. Because the reason it w became quite popular amongst ransomware is that it spread really fast and easily within uh, a network. And so this mechanism of Eternal Blue uh, was, was used then uh, to spread uh, ransomware across the network once you got in. So the question then becomes like, okay, so, so 
all of this memory exploitation, how does it affect me? And I think we have to go back to, to what I said in the beginning, how, how are they finding these vulnerabilities? They're generally finding them through fuzzing and using address sanitizer or some similar mechanism to address sanitizing. Uh, so these are malloc replacements that will some, somehow instrument memory. So the idea here is that these are things that you can do. You can use address sanitizer uh, both in your CI CD pipeline, you can use address sanitizer locally while testing, you can fuzz. There's all of these things that they're doing. It's not magic. And it's something that we can all do to, to uh, make our applications better. Because there is no magic here. They don't like just do typey typey on the keyboard and then suddenly they scream we're in. They're basically doing work that you are used to doing. This is basic, uh, basically a, a type of debugging and very similar to stuff that you've done before. So these bugs are bugs that you can find and fix. And they use the same tools you use. They use the same compilers. They use address sanitizer. They use all the same, same things that you are used to working with in your day to day. So if you want to make your application more secure, there's really just one answer, and that's fix bugs. Uh, they are using bugs to provoke weird behavior uh, in your application, and by doing so, trying to get to a point where they can execute code inside of your application and do what they want. The best way to make your application more secure is to fix those bugs. So that was my talk, and I think we could uh, get to, to Q&A now. Fabio, are you here? Uh, yes, here I am. Uh, I hope that the video works now again. Uh, we had a bit of problems with your video, but the sound seemed to be all right, and everyone could see your slides. OK, uh, that's good. Your face might have been out of the video for a while. Uh, so that's let's fine. see. We have just one question, and that is about, uh, isn't SMB version 1 no longer used today, or are there still installations supporting it? No, so, so uh, hopefully nobody's using it today. <laughs> but there are still, unfortunately, some places where, where it is still in use. And, it, and it, what we've seen, especially with, with these, these, windows, uh, these Windows exploits, was that certain sectors were more vulnerable than others. And those are sectors that are afraid to upgrade. So, so we saw especially hospitals and kind of medical type of, of industries that were very afraid to upgrade because the, it broke their equipment. And, and so there, there was a lot of trouble getting them to do Windows upgrades. But I, I, think, I think it's better now. Uh, you shouldn't be using SMB, uh, SMB V1 even with the fixes. You should definitely be using uh, V3. Um, but but uh, it depends. Like a lot, another thing that we saw, certain certain people had pirated uh, uh, Windows. They couldn't upgrade. <laughs> they were also vulnerable. So so yes, it's it's uh, it's an issue. And a new question just came in. Uh, is it possible to write absolutely invulnerable, fail-safe C++ code? I'll say no to that question. <laughs> No, okay. So, so that it's it's a little bit like saying like, can you write a C++ uh, program that does not invoke uh, undefined behavior? And the question is, is is a trick question because it's super hard not to have any undefined behavior. But we should try our bestest, right? Uh, and and that's that's where the, a lot of the new tooling comes in. A lot of modern C++ makes it easier to 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 write code where you won't make these mistakes. But but it's it's very it's very difficult to say for sure that you don't. So I would definitely go uh, following core guidelines type of things, using using the tools that you have, like Clang Tidy uh, and and uh, and the sanitizers and things like that to uh, to to help. I think there's another question. There is. Um, Ulrich asks. Can the dead store elimination be worked around? It sounds like a good idea to clear sensitive info once you're done with it. Yeah, no, uh, and several people have worked on this. Uh, so 
One of, one of the things that we had in C11 uh, was the uh, Annex K that was introduced in C11, which introduced a function uh, called uh, that that was specifically supposed to be used as a as a as a dead store eliminate safe memset. Unfortunately, Annex K was an optional uh, and uh, a part of, of C11 and was not adopted in C11. Uh, but it is supported on certain platforms. What we've seen is that most platforms introduce different functions like this themselves. And there has been work in future uh, C++ standards to try to find a portable way to, to tell the optimizer not to optimize this one away. Um, so they are all equally voted. So I can go into for more recent. Um, you mentioned that the heap was commonly executable in the past. What is the situation today? I thought only the program code is executable and immutable. Yeah. So this this uh, in most modern operating systems and especially desktop operating systems, this is uh, today uh, the heap the the system heap is usually not executable. Unfortunately, you will have applications that need to do jitting and things like that, and they will have to dynamically map pages to be executable for this jitting process. Because if you want to do just-in-time compilation, you have to actually write uh, executable code somewhere in memory and jump there. In addition, there are, are various uh, platform uh, APIs to, to remap pages or to allocate new pages that are executable. So, And there's a lot of legacy applications. Uh, that might have to turn this off because otherwise they don't work. And so it's uh, it's uh, complicated. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Um, so the next question is from Thomas. Uh, great talk. I completely agree that the fixed bugs conclusion, however, ASAN does not yet find everything. Um, there's, there's some limits. Um, what else do you suggest? Static analysis, CERT, MISRA, AUTOSAR? Um, so, so currently, I'm, I'm not a super big fan of, of, uh, of some of these secure coding standards, mostly because they are quite old often, and the solutions that they recommend are usually uh, not modern C++, but that might improve in the future. I know Peter Summerlin has been working to, to update some of this, uh, so, so hopefully we'll get uh, some updated standards maybe next year. Um, when it comes to static analysis, I would say yes. And, and, I, and I also want to say that these things are not alternatives. They are complementary. So definitely uh, lean hard into your, your static analysis tools and use them to, to find, find bugs in maybe code that you don't run very frequently. And, and it's also hopefully a very short feedback loop. You can integrate them locally into your IDE. You can find bugs really quickly. Uh, so, so I definitely say yes to both. Uh, and then Jonathan asks, if the applications aren't available outside of the organization, are these attacks impossible? So there's, uh, so I, I will have to do <laughs> another time to show you uh, an example of this, but there are some, some really obscure ways of exploitation. Like, the US and Israel went together to try to, to, to create a, a, like a, uh, a computer-based attack on Iran's uh, n like nuclear program, and they did that by attacking uh, uh, an embedded component in the refinery, uh, the the refining process for uranium inside of an of a, an air gap system inside of Iran, right? Uh, so, so the the point here is that if people want it enough. They'll, they will get their hands on it. And they'll usually do that in a variety of ways. Like the actors that you're dealing with uh, could be state sponsored, right? So they might actually have people who will physically go in uh, to your building to get a hold of what they need to, to do the analysis. And then in the case of, of, of this, this attack on Iran, uh, it is widely thought that the US actually built a facility mimicking the one in, in Iran uh, to test and develop their attack. So that's the kind of like scale some some governments are willing to do. Yeah. 
So we are out of time for the last questions, but if you have more and want those questions to be answers, answered and hear the answers, you can go to the launch and go to track B, to the Q&A session of track B, and Patricia will join there in a minute or so to answer more questions. Thank you, everyone, and bye.